Hey everyone and welcome to our online service once again. And thank you for joining us week after week, even as we go into God's Word and share with you what the Word of God says about our lives. And today, even in our praise segment, I want to encourage us with this text in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 37. The Bible says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the author goes on to detail the various things that we can face in our lives that potentially could separate us from God's love. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. Friends, some of us in this moment, in this time, might be facing tribulation. Maybe you're going through a certain trial in your family. Maybe you're going through a certain workplace situation that is disrupting the peace you have in your heart. Or maybe you're going through a lack of resources or even the danger of your life, your health. And Paul goes on to say, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. He makes a statement that is so powerful that encapsulates what he was trying to say. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In the very things he just outlined earlier, in famine, in danger, in distress, in the lack of resources, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who love us. I want to encourage you and me as well today, friends, in our prayer time. The love of God is the very thing that sees us through. The love of God is the very thing that keeps us Regardless of what we go through, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. But not forgetting, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. And let us pray. Father, I pray right now that even as we dwell on this word today, that we will remember the love of God for our lives. That we will remember how much you love us, how much you value us, how much you treasure us, that you would send your one and only Son to die for us, Lord, so that we can have new life in you. Father, we pray, even as we watch the next few minutes of the message, we pray, Lord, let us realize your love so evidently, so real, to be so real in our lives, that we would never, ever lose sight that Jesus loves me, that God loves me, Period. We thank you and we ask all this in your name. Amen and amen. And now, let's get our hearts ready for the Word of God. Hi there, it's glad to be, I'm just glad to be back here once again to do the time of meditation upon the Word of God for the online service. And we are still in the Gospel of Matthew and today we are looking at chapter 21. And in this passage, as I was dwelling upon it, two words came to mind. True colors. When we say, say that we saw someone in their true colors, we basically mean that we saw the person for who the person is really like. And in this passage, I'm believing that we are going to see the true colors of Jesus and also the true colors of people in general. That is you and that could be me as well. True colors of Jesus and people. As we go into the passage, I want you to have this picture in mind about one of that of a donkey. The other one uh, of the temple, in the temple in those days, in Jesus' time, they always had Corinthian pillars, the temple, and also that of a tree, in particular a fig tree. We pick up the story in verse 1 of Matthew 21. It says here, Now when they, Jesus and his disciples, drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives. In the last week before Jesus was crucified, there was three significant times that Jesus was on the Mount of Olives or he passed by the Mount of Olives. Right, the first will be this one whereby, whereby we're going to look at it a little bit more as we unpack the story. The second time is known as the Olivet Discourse. It is, is the time whereby Jesus was teaching more about the end times. And the third will be the time that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, crying out to God the Father, if it is possible, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. So three significant times in the last week before Jesus was crucified, the Mount of Olives. Showing you a map here, 
just to give you a frame of uh, the Mount of Olives and in where on your screen, right in the center on the right side is Bethpage. That's where Jesus was at. Going towards the left side of your screen, that is Jerusalem. That's where you see the temple and the other places. All right, and slightly lower down on the bottom and on your right side is there's an arrow pointing to Bethany. All right, Bethpage to Jerusalem is about maybe one kilometer. And from Jerusalem towards Bethany is about three, 3.2 kilometers. All right, zooming a little bit, and uh, just taking away all the other uh, names of the places, the things that are more familiar to us maybe is the Pool of Bethesda. That's where Jesus healed a paralyzed man, a man that was 38 years paralyzed and miraculously he was healed. The Pool of Siloam is where Jesus saw this man blind and then he, he, he took earth and then made mud from his spit and placed it on a man's eyes and after that asked him to go and wash at the Pool of Siloam and that's where he received his sight. Mir miraculous healing once again. Golgotha is the place whereby Jesus was crucified. And then, of course, there's the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was praying the night before he was eventually taken and crucified. Well, this story is about Bethpage, Bethany, three significant places, then the temple as well. So it goes on to tell us in Matthew 21 that then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. And in verse 4 and 5, it says here that this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a beast of burden. This is a quote from Zechariah 9.9, 9, one of the many prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, that he was going to go into Jerusalem, not riding on a horse, not coming like a, a warrior king, but he was going into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. This is one of Jesus' true colors being revealed. Jesus, his truth revealed. Riding on a donkey, a donkey is humble, right? Uh, riding on a donkey also means this in the context then, uh, a king then can come on a war horse or also a king can also come on a donkey. Right? When a king actually makes the choice to ride on a donkey into the city, it means that the king is saying that I am coming in peace. And this is who Jesus is, isn't it? Humble and peaceable. Not what the crowds was expecting, that they wanted a king, one that will come and free them by force. But Jesus humbled himself as God, humbled himself to the point of going to death on the cross for us, humble and peaceable. This is who Jesus is. In verse 8 and 9, it tells us, Most of the crowd spread their clothes on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, which means praise to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This was Jesus coming from Bethpage, going into Jerusalem. This was on a Sunday morning. And the crowd saw him coming, was praising, worshipping him, saying, Praise be to Jesus, Son of the Most High. And this is Sunday morning for us as well. All right, uh, for most of us when we go to church, on a Sunday morning, we are praising God, we are worshipping God, that this is the one our full focus is upon. This is the story as well. On Sunday, he went into Jerusalem. All this was taking place. And then in the evening, he leaves and he goes to Bethany. We are looking at the passage in Matthew 21. If you look at the same account in Mark chapter 11, go read this for yourself. Mark 11 maps out this whole account more in a chronological order. Right. So Sunday morning, Jesus goes in. The crowds were worshipping him. Sunday evening, he leaves. And then Monday morning, he goes back into Jerusalem and now he goes into the temple. What happened then? Right, for all of us, if Sunday is the day, we go to church, we worship God, we praise God. This is now your Monday, my Monday. Jesus was going back to Jerusalem on a Monday morning. Verse 12 and 13, he says that Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. This is once again another area about Jesus, all right, his true colors being revealed. 
He is non-compromising and firm in what areas? In the areas whereby it's about self. There's this focus about selfish gain. There's this focus about uh, self-serving behavior, self-focus. And this was what that same crowd that on Sunday was worshipping God. On Monday, now they're in the temple and their focus was for personal gain rather than focusing upon God, taking the name of God in vain. And for Jesus, He's totally non-compromising in this area. We see this. He, he, he overturned the tables. He was very firm in this religious behavior, self-focused, self-righteous behavior because when we are always about looking inward self, our worship is no longer to worship God. We are worshiping ourselves. Luke 18 talks about a tax collector and a Pharisee coming before God in the temple. The Pharisee, self-righteous, was saying basically this, that, hey, look at me, God. I'm not as bad as this other guy. He's a sinner. The tax collector, humble, bow before God and acknowledge that, God, I am a sinner. I need you. And Jesus says the one that was justified was not the Pharisee, the self-righteous one, but rather the tax collector who acknowledged that he is a sinner. Jesus his truth revealed, humble and peaceable. And when we think about the temple, right, he's non-compromising and firm. In regards to worship, worship should true only to be the one and only God, which is Jesus. Anything else, Jesus is very non-compromising because if you are self-inward looking, worship is now worshipping yourself rather than God. What happened when Jesus took this firm stand? It tells us in verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in a temple and he healed them. The blind and the lame came into the temple and he healed them. Blind people cannot see. Lame people got no strength to persevere. Maybe that's you today. You feel that you are blind. I can't see what's ahead for me in my life. Or maybe you feel that you're lame. You, have, you feel that I got no more strength to press through, to push through. Well, what was the key? The key that Jesus is showing us is this, be non-compromising. Are you having a self-righteousness, self-inward focus that you're, you're, you're so full of yourself, uh, but learn now to be non-compromising, to put that aside, to put your focus towards God, to worship Him fully. When you do that, the blindness will be taken away, that you will be able to see where God is leading you. Strength will come back into you. Be like Jesus, non-compromising and firm in the things of God, especially worship to God. In verse 15 and 16, it tells us this, when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna, praise to the son of David. They were indignant or they were angry and they said to him, do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never heard out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? The the chief priests and the scribes were angry because pure worship was coming out from children. Have you wondered, and think about this, why? Why were they upset when they see pure, uh, unadulterated worship, worship that has no agenda coming out from, from young people or young children? Why are they upset? It could be this. One is that it could be something that Maybe, maybe they were just simply envious and jealous about Jesus, that they wanted the same kind of things happening to them. Pride. They wanted the same kind of adoration happening to them. It was self-focused once again, and that's why maybe they could be angry because of that. The other thing is this, it could be they're watching this, the children just praising and worshipping pure, wholehearted, no agenda. In fact, if there's an agenda, it's only about God, about Jesus it could be the chief priests and the scribes, they knew that their worship was not fully centered upon God, fully centered upon Jesus, and they got upset, they got angry. You know, when God offends us, often it reveals what's actually on our hearts. Over in this account, I believe Jesus is showing us His true colors, that He's looking for true worshipers, those who will worship in spirit and in truth. Well, we recently just had a youth camp and the next three points actually I took from one of our young leaders. He was sharing these three points about faith and I will say this also relates to worship as well. 
Jesus is looking for true worshippers. The question is, are we faking it? Are you worshipping, lifting up your hands on a Sunday, right? but on the inside, worship is not taking place. On a Monday, everything changes. It's all about self. This was the people then. On a Sunday, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. They were worshipping Jesus. The very next day, they were now so full of self, self-righteousness, self-focus, focus on just selfish gains rather than worshipping and honouring God. Are you faking it? Or are you borrowing it? Is your worship or your faith leaning simply upon your friend? Leaning upon your spouse? Leaning upon your parents? Leaning upon maybe your life group leader? Leaning upon your pastor? Leaning upon your church? If all of this is taken away, will you still be worshipping God? Are you a true worshipper? Or are you simply just renting it? What do I mean by renting it? Is your worship to God dependent upon what happens in your life? Something good happens to me, I get a promotion, I get a new job, I get to go for a, for a vacation. Whoa, God is good. I'm worshipping God. He's so good. But when, when something not so good happens, I no longer worship. That is a renting it kind of faith or renting it kind of worship. Whether something good happens to me or not, who God is does not change. God is love. God is good. God is a healer. Whether I'm healed or not, God is still a healer and He's still worthy of worship and praise. Whether I get my provision or not, God has never changed. He's still a provider. In John 4, 23, it tells us this, but the hour is coming and it's now here when true worshippers, true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. True worshippers in spirit and in truth True worshippers are the ones who worship whereby their worship is not governed by their emotions. Whether I feel like worshipping or not is governed by the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ within us, the Holy Spirit within us. And in truth, the truth of God's Word, the truth of who God said He is, true worshippers worship from that posture. This is Paul and Silas. When they were thrown in prison, beaten already, in terms of how they were feeling, for sure they were feeling lousy. Right, in terms of uh, whatever that's happening around them, there was no good in a sense. But the very next thing they did when they were thrown in prison, they started worshipping God in spirit and in truth. Is that you today? Well, back to the account. Sunday morning, Jesus rode on a donkey. People were worshipping. He left and went to Bethany. And likely he stayed at an Airbnb. Or likely he stayed at maybe Mary and Martha's house. Uh, that's where they stayed, in Bethany. And then Monday morning, he goes back into the temple. We just talked about that account. One other thing happened in Monday morning before he reached the temple is this. Jesus passed by a tree, a fig tree. He looked at the fig tree and he did something there. What did he do? I'll share in a moment, right? After, after Monday, he left again and went back to Bethany. And then Tuesday morning, he comes back and then he sees this same fig tree, but something has changed. All right, what happened in this account? All right, verse 18 and 19 will tell us, in the morning, that's Monday morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it, found nothing on it but only leaves, and he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. Jesus, hungry, go to this fig tree. No fruit, and guess what? He actually spoke death to this tree. He actually cursed this tree. Put it very directly, he cursed this tree. And then what happens next? We carry on in the, in the passage. And it says that the end of fig tree withered at once. Now, in Mark, like I say, Mark chapter 11, this whole account is in chronological order. In Matthew, Matthew as a gospel writer is more focused on just recording and drawing out the key principles that what Jesus was trying to show us. The first one I already mentioned is this, that Jesus actually cursed the tree. He spoke death into the tree and then the tree actually died, which means there's power of death and life in our tongue, whatever we speak. Right? So at once here, uh, actually means at the next day the disciples saw it on Tuesday morning. It didn't happen immediately. Right? When the disciples saw it, they marveled and they say, how did the fig tree wither? Right? And that's where, that's where, this is the point, right? In Proverbs 18, 21, it says that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. I just came off from a teaching 
bringing us back to the book of Genesis whereby there was nothing and then God spoke and light came. In fact, God spoke and the whole world, the whole creation was made just by, just by speaking, speaking life. And if God speaks life and life comes and we are made in the image of God, which simply means this, when we speak life, life ought to come. But when we speak death, death can happen also. This is many years ago. Uh, my mom had a short vacation on her own, maybe about a week or so, and then it leaves just me and my dad at home, and we were supposed to take care of the house. I'm not sure how many of you can relate to this. When mom is away, the house eventually ends up being an entire mess. In fact, at the end of the week, the last day, the day she was coming back, I had my friend that was staying over with me. The house was a, a mess. It wasn't, this is not my actual house, but it would look kind of like, like that. It was, it was in a terrible state. My dad came home early from work that day and says, uh, and when I saw him, I said, hey, pa, how come you're back home early from work? And then he says in a panic look, don't you realize that mommy is coming back today? I said, yeah, then we need to clean up the house. That's why I came back early. So, okay, okay. So we started doing it. We clean up everything, clear up everything. Everything was nice and neat. And then suddenly we realized we had one problem. My mom had a lot of plants. And during that one week, I'm not sure, maybe we did water, maybe we didn't. Uh, but the plants was, okay, looking like the one on the left of your screen right now. Right? It's kind of, it was kind of like dying. <laughs> we tried to put as much water as possible all right, on it to try to get it back to life. But obviously it wasn't working. You know, when mommy came back, she was very happy with the state of the house in terms of it was so clean. But okay, we couldn't answer for the plants. My mom was one that is known to have very green fingers. All right, which means this, whatever she planted actually grew and blossomed really, really, really well. And you know, I realized the key was this. I think while she was away, we lightly poured water, but we didn't speak life to the plants. My mom would talk to the plants. All right, and for my mom, her plants looked like that, those on the right side. All right, this is a picture that was taken whereby it was an experiment done whereby the plant on the left, Right, we had curses spoken to, into it. The plant on the right uh, had life spoken to it. And then after a while, there is actually a difference. Power of life and death in our tongue. This is one of the principles that I believe Jesus was showing to us. Hey, there's, there's power of life and death even as we speak. Regarding the fig tree, he cursed it. The next day, it withered and died. What was the next thing that Jesus was showing us from this account? Showing the same verses again that when he saw the fig tree, he found nothing on it. And that's the reason why he cursed that fig tree. If you study the context of this account, this was the season, this was not the season for fig trees to bear fruit, actually. It was not even in season. And Jesus went to the plant, went to this tree, saw no fruit, and he cursed it. Is that even fair? It's not even the season. Well, I believe... Jesus was showing all of us. The Bible talks a lot about us bearing fruit. For us, right, if you ever remember a fig tree or see a, fruit, uh, uh, a tree, right, Jesus expects us to bear fruit in season or out of season, which means all the time. Right? We may be thinking that, hey, only in the good season that I bear fruit, when I'm not feeling so good, it's a bad season, I do not have to bear the fruit of Jesus no, Jesus is teaching us this, that He expects all of us who have the life of Christ in us to bear fruit all the time, which means Jesus expects transformed lives. Let's be real about this. Where are you at today? Is there the fruit of the Spirit coming of, out, coming forth from you? Let's be real about this. Is this taking place in your life? Well, if it's not, if it is, both ways, well, continue just to stay connected to the vine. If you think of a plant, the way a plant or a tree bears fruit is to just stay connected to the vine. Right? The plant or the tree doesn't have to try to bear fruit as long as it's connected. Right? And then there's enough nourishment and water, it will bear fruit. Stay connected to God. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus and allow Him to refresh you, speak to you. Stay close to Jesus and listen to the voice of God. What Daddy God is speaking and saying about you. And I guarantee you, God will be speaking blessing. God will be saying, I love you. God will be saying, you're amazing. God will be saying that 
you have the strength to overcome. God will be speaking to you and from there, life will flow from you. Transformation will take place. Jesus expects that. Last thing is this, is to learn how to speak to the mountain. If you're feeling that, hey, there are certain areas in my life, Mark, if I'm going to be honest with you, it's not bearing fruit. Well, learn to speak to the mountain. Where is this coming from? The next two verses, verse 21 and 22. It says here, And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive it if you have faith. That you're able to say to a mountain, go. Let me see if there's an area whereby I know I'm not bearing the fruit of Christ in this area in my life. Learn how to speak to the mountain. What do I mean by that? Right, Galatians 5, 22, 23, it talks about, the, it describes the fruit of the Spirit. First, learn to stay connected to the vine and hear the voice of God speaking over you. I often ask this question to God, God, what do you think about me? And I will hear Him speaking life, life, life over me and transformation takes place. But I also had to learn to do this for myself. That, okay, if there's power, life and death in my tongue, it first begins here. Then what am I speaking even over myself? Galatians 5, 22, 23 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And this one thing, can I encourage all of you to try? It, tomorrow or even after you watch this stream, all right, go and look yourself in the mirror and speak life over yourself. Declare this, I'm loving. I'm joyful, I am peaceable, I am patient, I am kind, I am good, I am gentle, I am faithful, I am self-controlled. Speak life over yourself and see the transformation that will take place in your life. True colors. We see the true colors of Jesus being revealed and also over ourselves as well. Jesus, His truth revealed is this, that He is humble and peaceable. He comes to us in a humble and peaceable manner, not by force. He's non-compromising and firm. And likewise, we ought to be non-compromising and firm with regards to things about God, things of worship to God. And when that takes place, blindness will go. Right? We will gain new strength within our life. Uh, Jesus also is authoritative and powerful. Is this us also? Well, this is what Jesus said to us. He's given us power and authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and nothing of the enemy will harm us, that we too have the authority that Jesus has. In fact, Jesus was questioned about his authority. Where did this come from? Well, Jesus, regards to this area, refused to give an answer because it was very clear to him his authority came from God, God the Father. And likewise for us, we can believe in the same. We do not have to explain it to anyone else, but we can have the faith to believe that God has given us authority and power as well. Jesus is looking for true worshippers. Don't fake it, don't borrow it, don't rent it. He's looking for those who will worship in spirit and in truth, not governed by emotions, not governed by what's happening around us, but by the truth of God. And lastly is this, Jesus expects us, expects to see transformed lives. Let's be real about it. Stay connected to the vine and speak. Speak life over yourself and you will see transformation taking place even in your own life. As we close uh, this time of meditation upon the Word of God, well, take up your bread and your cup. The reason why we can believe to be transformed, the reason why we can believe to be the true worshippers Jesus is looking for, and the reason why we can even believe that we can be like Jesus, humble, peaceable, non-compromising, authoritative and powerful, simply because of what Jesus had done on the cross. His body broken for us, his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And simply means this is but by the grace of God. And so, Father, I pray, even as we come to the close of our time of meditation upon the Word, that, Lord, we give you thanks for your body broken for us, your blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. That is by grace, through faith, that we have been saved. That we can become more like you. We can be transformed in our lives to bear fruit and much fruit for you and we will be the true worshippers that you are looking for. We give you thanks. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark, for your word on true colours. I know some of you are thinking about the song, but I want to encourage you, let's really go back to that message because there are so many of us that may be living 
under a weight, under a burden that makes us different from who God has made us to be. And God desires that we be true worshippers who worship Him in spirit and in truth. So now even in our time of giving, our worship continues. And again, going back to the text that I outlined in our prayer segment earlier, Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Friends, I want to encourage you with this one statement, even in our giving, that even as we give, we are reminded that we are living in the love of God. That God has blessed us so generously, given us all the things that we ever need. And this is our time to honour Him back with our tithes and our offerings. So we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. And we ask and pray that you bless every person that is giving today. We thank you and we ask all this in your name. Amen and amen. And so you know how to give. You can scan the QR code. I just want to say thank you for your giving as well. And don't leave yet. We have just a few announcements, a bit more this week. But bear with me. Prayer and Worship Night is coming up on the 5th of July, Friday, 7.30 p.m. Right here at Hall A at City Hub 1. I want to encourage us, join in. Because this is where we encounter God in an extended time of worship. Sometimes Sundays can be so rushed in, rushed out, but this is a time we can set aside time to encounter His presence. And of course, Serve Our City. If you're looking to partner with us to serve our community, wheelchair cleaning is available again at a Red Cross home. And we want to encourage you. It's on the 6th of July, Saturday, 4 to 6 p.m. If you are free, if you're available, to come and join us, to partner with us, to serve our city and community. And of course, if you are Mandarin speaking, we have our Mandarin Fellowship happening again on the 6th of July as well in the evening right here at City Hub Hall C, 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. So if you know anyone who speaks Mandarin or is more comfortable in a Mandarin setting, I want to encourage you, invite them. Or if you yourself are more comfortable in a Mandarin setting, I want to encourage you to join us for this fellowship. And last but not least, foundation class. We have the run again. This time happening on part one happening on the 7th of July. And I want to encourage you 1.30 to 4 p.m. again on the 7th of July and of course on the 14th of July again. Join us for a two-part session to understand the essentials of what it means to be a follower of Christ, Christ as our firm foundation. So when you register, don't forget you're registering for both sessions. So do lock the dates down. God bless you. We've come to the end of the service. I want to encourage you, keep going and don't give up and let's keep living the Word of God out. God bless you and have a great week ahead. Lift you high